Hello and welcome back, all of you fantastic people. We have our new episode of Tabletop Simulator for Dungeons and Dragons. It's been a long time coming and I'm happy to be back. A lot of, uh, a lot of life has happened um, since our last episode. Chloe and I uh, moved into a new place. We got a nice computer set up where we're sitting side by side. So hopefully once we've kind of settled in and exams have settled down and we get some time, we're going to start up our streaming again. It's going to be great. Um, so there's been plenty of requests and I have definitely wanted to do this for a while for another Tabletop Sim video. And last time I had decided that the next video will be about running an encounter. Uh, so this is the first episode about running an encounter, going over kind of the logistics to what you need to start setting up in Tabletop Simulator Encounters. So this encounter map I made through grabbing a mod for kind of the base kind of mountain gulch. I threw in the fireplaces, the torches, uh, uh, and some other scenery as well as the enemies and props. So a little backstory. So this is a new group uh, that I am DMing for. Uh, three of the four players have never played D&D ever. So I needed something that could light the fire under them that wouldn't just be you walk into a tavern and try and come up with some motivation that you like each other. I didn't want to have to put them on their shoulders or put that on their shoulders when they haven't had that experience yet. So I wanted to uh, set them ablaze. Basically, I threw them straight into a adrenaline pumping. We got to move together, act together or we are screwed. So how it worked out is whoever, however, their backstories ended up, they all surrounded around this one pass called the Oof Orel mountain range where through various means, a clan of roaming goliaths had knocked them unconscious, uh, and they have woken up in this pit down here. There was a bear here, and the master goliath was up on this little perch, uh, surrounded by other goliaths, kind of cheering in a coliseum-esque situation, uh, and the master goliath had prompted them, You must fight to find out who we are eating for dinner tonight. Uh, and that... It, as soon as he finished that, the bear roared and charged. So it gave them a fantastic little motivation like, oh crap, I don't know who these other three players are, but or other three people are, um, what they're doing or why they're here. But right now, we need to fight for our lives or we're eaten. So I was pretty proud of this instant motivation. Like, let's get moving. You're working together. Um, they obviously won the fight and found themselves bound up up on this little cliffside, with the only exit being out this way. Um, you can't really see them because we have a finite amount of map space, but I just said surrounding this entire map besides this little narrow pass was sheer rock wall, and this river disappeared into a cave. Um, so their only real options out were through this pass or in the river down the cave uh, to whatever lies in that cave. So. The, the four of them found themselves on this uh, cliff area bound around their hands and their legs with their equipment and weapons stored in this case over here. Uh, the gnome has proficiency in cooking utensils and successfully persuaded them to let him and an assistant cook their bear for them for the night, allowing them to be freed of their binds, brought down to the cooking station, and begin cooking either to woo the guards and put them in a favorable situation in which they could try to escape or some other outcome that remains to be unseen or remained to be unseen at this point. So the two up here um, were still bound and couldn't really do much. Uh, they had a nice kind of opportunity to try and talk to each other while they couldn't really do anything. Once they started getting impatient, uh, Sahalia, the druid uh, Ganassi, had beckoned this guard over here and through an extremely good persuasion check uh, acted like a little whimpering puppy and got the Goliath, the, the dumb Goliath who rolled a 2 on his intelligence check on whether or not he thought this person would be dangerous with her hands available uh, decided that it was okay to release her hand binds. Um, now that she had her somatic element to her spellcasting available, she was able to cast a uh, Ray of Frost and release the binds on Merrick, their 
uh, uh, Pact of the Blade Warlock. Um, this obviously was not done very stealthily, and so the Goliaths came over, and long story short, an encounter ensued. Uh, we had a nice unique situation where two of them were up here, and the others were down there. Neither of these two groups had weapons available to them besides Sahalia and her ability to cast spells. Uh, so, the encounter has begun, and we are in Tabletop Simulator. So, the first element to any encounter in D&D is music. Let's head on over to our music. So here we go. We got Spotify ready. I have a whole folder created of various music. Um, some is just background music for when they're traveling uh, anywhere. We got uh, towns and cities music. Um, pub music, which is always a bunch of fun and high energy. And then we got our battle music, action music, dark music. It depends on the scenario and the environment. But we need some sort of kind of high energy or eerie background music to get pumping. If you're running your campaign in more of a realistic sort of vein, you may be interested in realistic background sounds. So what I'd suggest that I found and love is ambient-mixer.com. Uh, you can go to games.ambient-mixer.com and there are a whole bunch of different sounds that people have created with various mixtures of uh, what's going on in the background of wherever the environment might be. So say you're in, a, in some town or in some pub, you can just play these in the background and get a nice little ambiance going. Uh, and if you want, what you can do so that you don't have to actively manage the background sounds. Uh, you can go to Components, Tools, and Tablet. Now here you go. You browse through ambient-mixer.com, pick out which one you want to take. Say we want Tavern by the Fireside. You click that, grab the URL, and then come on over to here and pop that on into that URL. It'll load up on the iPad, start playing for whoever is uh, in the tabletop sim, um, and then you can lock that and save it with this file. And now whenever you load up into this map, it'll start playing that background music for you. Um, so I think that's a lot of fun. Um, it works especially well if you're playing tabletop simulator in a multiplayer environment where you have multiple users who are around your table. It'll load up and they can hear it as well. Um, it's really nice and convenient. So we got our music or background sound playing and we need to manage our encounter. Uh, I'm a huge fan of dynamic encounters. I think it can be uh, a, a huge slog if all of a sudden your Goliaths just run up to the melee people and it's just each turn is just, okay, he rolls to hit, he hits, he does this damage, he rolls to hit, he hits, he does this damage, just repeating until somebody falls. Um, so it, it's kind of a hard and tricky art to master, but if you can get down a dynamic sort of encounter conflict going, it can really make things a little bit more chaotic. So these people had aggravated the nearby Goliaths over here. He charges across uh, the bridge and blocks their entrance to the bridge, beating them up. Um, this instantly creates conflict. They need to get through him to get to the bridge to get to their weapons. Um, that led to some improvised torch kicking uh, and some casting as this guy kind of starts waking up from his slumber and starts uh, running and screaming and trying to alert the sleeping guards over here. We had this guy was actually down here guarding these two down cooking. Um, they start fighting. Uh, no, he actually witnesses them fighting up here and starts running around trying to run up this cliffside for several turns, but also waking up these guys, waking up these guys, including the master, who has a crossbow. Um, so, we get some nice kind of fluid action going on, where it's not just this one conflict over here, there's a whole bunch of moving parts happening over here, and this guy is going to introduce a ranged element to the combat that they're definitely going to need to worry about, because he has a nice, nice view of the battle uh, going on in this area. Um, so what we need to do is roll for initiative. Uh, you ask your players to roll for initiative, 
And what you can do so that everybody can see it is you can edit this note. And so I have Akithros Merrick Merrick Sahalia and Moni Moni Tor. Uh, you ask them for their initiative rolls and then say Akithros, he rolled a 17. You do that and then you can be done editing the note and it'll just lock that in and now your players viewing the screen can see who is what in the initiative order. Um, makes it easy so that they can know when their turn is coming and they can try and prepare for it beforehand so it's a more flu fluid combat experience. Uh, now, of course, we need to figure out initiative for the bad guys. Um, depending on the amount of one type of bad guy, I generally prefer to have them all run under the same initiative order. Um, it kind of gives this kind of, oh, now this guy is going to do this one move, and then three turns later, maybe this guy will do this other move. Um, having them move kind of en masse uh, kind of can make it a little bit scarier. It adds this kind of sequence of chaos and damage coming in at the same time, and then the rest of the party can react accordingly. Uh, with such a large amount of um, bad guys, I would maybe suggest rolling for them in groups. So maybe these two would roll at the same, get the same roll value. This group would roll as, get the same roll value and such. So how I manage encounters and something that I love dearly is an app called Campaign Lab. It is available on Android and I also imagine on iOS. I will link it in the description below. Um, but it has this amazing encounter manager. You can uh, plug in, it has the all of the resources uh, like Monster Manual, Player's Handbook and such available for monsters. You can have it automatically roll for randomized health of your enemies roll for initiative for your enemies and then you could go through the encounter using the app and on your different enemies you can click on their names it'll bring you to the uh, player sheet of that enemy makes it super super easy as a dm to manage encounters and that will probably be what my next video is is a tutorial on how to use campaign lab um and i, I can't recommend it enough so once you get that going uh you need some way of kind of keeping track of which uh, enemy is which in your campaign lab uh, encounter manager or whether you write it down on this note or whatever you're doing to manage your initiative in your combat order. So what you do or what I do is you right click each person and just say you are G1 um, and then come on over here. I don't need you. Oh God. Well, it's just gonna, it's just gonna be there. Oh, it's gone, okay. Right click you. Uh, you're also gonna move under G1 because they're getting the same roll. So now if you hover over G1, you can see it pop up with their name. And then I say I roll for them uh, and I put them in the initiative order for my characters to see the G1 group rolled a 15. Um, and now the characters uh, know when this group of Goliaths are going to move. Um, it really helps. You can then also uh, coordinate that with your campaign lab numbers for the different Goliaths because it'll, if you say you plop down nine Goliaths, it'll then in the initiative show Goliath number one, Goliath number two. Um, and so you can kind of manage that in the app as well. Um, and then for this guy, I named him uh, like Master. Uh, and then in here, let's say uh, he... I'll say master rolled a eight and boom. So there we go. So as the battle ensues, uh, various amounts of chaos happen. Um, Merrick having tried to get the guard off of the way of the bridge, he's able to successfully get him away. Uh, and he needs his, uh, sword. So he is running over to the, um, bridge. Uh, but doesn't have enough movement to kind of get out of the way of this guy's axe and is scared of what he's going to do because he's already suffered a pretty brutal opportunity attack and doesn't want to be around for when G1 gets another turn. Uh, keep in mind, they're all level one, so they have pretty low health. Uh, he uses his actions 
or his action to cut the bridge and rolls well on an athletics check to hold onto the bridge as it swings on down and smacks into the wall below, successfully out of the axe range of this bad guy. Um, so what we can do to kind of show that's happening is just right click and delete each of these bridge elements. Uh, and now we can see that the battlefield is changing. Um, now here's another kind of trick. As you can see this ladder is real high up. And if I move Merrick under the ladder, he actually raises up above. That's a setting that depending on the build of your map could be good or bad. And that is you right click Merrick, go to toggles, go to auto raise. So auto raise when a held object will automatically raise above other potential collisions and ignore collisions when held. So we're going to turn that off and now he can easy peasy move underneath that bridge and he's not going to raise on top of it. But you're going to want to turn that on if you kind of want to raise him up another level or else it's kind of like looking a little bit challenging. So he is swung down and slammed while holding onto the rope bridge uh, to this point. Uh, and this has introduced a another fluid dynamic to our battle, is the map is changing. Um, as the guards begin moving and charging, uh, these guards are waking up, blah blah blah, fight continues, chasing, creating a fluid, um, adrenaline pumping environment. Uh, now what happens when they attack and eventually kill an enemy? You're going to want to somehow reflect that an enemy is dead. So say this Goliath gets killed. Uh, he looks like a pretty mean dude, so that would be a pretty tough one. Um, you could just leave him there and like say that he's like dash dead defed. Um, it'll show up there, but it's kind of hard for the players. They might not know. So you can flip them by grabbing them, hit F and release. Uh, annoyingly, it perfectly flips them and they land on their head and stay like that. Uh, in the moment that works, it looks kind of goofy. Uh, if you don't want to have just a complete flip like that, you can pick them up and then give them a little toss. Um, didn't work out so well here, but you can get the idea where if you can toss them right there, look, he looks nice and dead. Um, if you can toss them right, they'll fall forward on their side and look like a dead person. Um, and there you go. You got a nice uh, dead enemy as bodies are littering the battleground as fight and violence continues. Hey guys, quick thing that I forgot to mention that I think is definitely very important, so I felt it was valuable to cut in here real quick, is uh, area of effect abilities that affect the battlefield. So uh, Chloe's character in our other campaign, so right now she's playing Sahalia the Druid. Um, in our other campaign, she's playing a sorceress and she has one of her favorite abilities is the wall of fire um so when she casts that you want some way of reflecting that on the battlefield uh thankfully there is a wall of fire um fire block that you can put down um and that will show an awesome effect that will also not only look pretty but serve the purpose of showing where is the hostile zone of this wall of fire um you can layer a couple down to reflect the full area that the wall of fire encompasses um, and will add a nice little dynamic to the battlefield. Um, and then another kind of difficult part is say Monitor has some ability that affects a cube or a cone shaped area in front of him. We can have this nifty little area of effect calculator. So what we do is we just plop it straight onto the corner of that square, blow it up to the size of our squares, and then I can right click and change the state and you can hover over you can see 15 foot cones straight ahead diagonal that changes it up and then I can use Q and E to rotate um, and show what squares he's going to affect with his move uh, but let's say we're going to have a uh, what do we got I want a 30 foot radius ability uh, pretty big um, so anybody within 30 feet radius is going to get affected. I can plop this handy dandy right on that square dividing line. Uh, it's every now and then the small minute changes in size are going to amplify across. Maybe I might be able to expand it to be perfect. Oh yeah, it, it's pretty, pretty ideal. Um, so yeah, you, you, it's a fantastic mod uh, that you could find just by looking up 
um, area of effect uh, in the workshop for Tabletop Sim that combined with all the different kind of awesome world effects you can find, whether it be walls of fire or maybe uh, some an ice surface that spawned on the ground causing enemies to have to make a deck save or fall prone. Uh, those are wonderful things that your players will definitely appreciate um, reflecting in the battlefield, kind of showing these awesome abilities that your players have and showing a visual representation of what they're creating and how it's going to affect the battlefield. So quickly cut back to the rest of the video. Eventually, the after Sahalia making a, a good honest effort to try and jump into the river, she smacks into the tree and falls unconscious. Um, these two... Uh, grab a plate of flaming oil from the fireplace while they are cooking, use it as a temporary weapon as they cross the bridge, light the bridge on fire using the oil, wake up Sahalia with um, a healing word by our Monitor the Bard. Merrick climbs up the bridge ladder, grabs all the weapons and throws them down for the rest of them to grab, and they make their mad dash away as the flaming bridge covers their tracks behind them. They make an athletics check to see how, how hard they can sprint and how long to put some good solid distance between them and this Goliath clan. Um, and there we go. That's the, the basics of running an encounter. You've got uh, naming which groups you want to move under which initiative order. Putting your initiative order in the note for everybody in the game to see. Um, you've got flipping them over to reflect them as dying characters, and you've got kind of a basic introduction to making fluid battle maps that'll introduce a layer of excitement on top of combat, which can, depending on the structure, can be grueling, but with that fluid dynamics, um, it's going to be a lot more fun. Uh, next up, we're going to make a video about running our initiative and encounters in Campaign Lab, uh, and all of the uh, great joys that comes with that. So thank you so much for watching, and I will see you very soon.